my childhood, one of the first missionaries I remember learning about wasn't Robert Moffat, nor Hudson Taylor, nor David Livingston, nor even a missionary with whom I share a name, Amy Carmichael. Now, the one I remember, and that captivated my imagination, and perhaps, though I did not realize it at the time, sparked the first interest in missions in Africa in my heart and mind, was Mary Slusser. Now, there is a biography written about her life, which I believe to be the best ever written. It's called A Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary, written by W.P. Livingston, which we'll be referencing throughout the book, and which prefaces the book with these opening words. Life for most people is governed by authority and convention, but behind these there lies always the mystery of human nature, uncertain and elusive, and apt now and again to go off at a tangent and disturb the smooth working of organized routine. Some man or woman will appear who departs from the normal order of procedure, who follows ideals rather than rules, and whose methods are irregular, and often, in the eyes of onlookers, unwise. They may be poor or frail, and in their own estimation of no account, yet it is often they who are used for the accomplishment of important ends. Such a one was Mary Slusser. A wave of evangelistic endeavors was on the rise by the time of Mary's birth on December 2, 1848. In fact, something we will talk about in a later episode is the mission where she would work, called the Calabar Mission, which was founded just two years before her birth in 1846. Now, to better understand Mary Slusser and the work she accomplished, we need to understand the early years of her life. Mary was born near Aberdeen. Her father, Robert Slusser, was a shoemaker. Her mother was an only child, and had been brought up in a home of refinement and religious devotion. She is described by those who knew her as a sweet-faced woman, patient, gentle, and retiring, with a deeply religious disposition, but without any particular feature of character such as one would expect to find in the mother of so uncommon a daughter. Mary was the second of seven children. Very little about her early childhood years is known. As previously mentioned, the Calabar mission had just opened two years before her birth, and Bar Mary had mentioned that some of her earliest recollections were associated with the name of Calabar. Now, note, we will use the term Calabar throughout this and subsequent episodes about the life of Mary Slusser, but to help our modern understanding, uh, the region of Africa being referenced as Calabar is the country of Nigeria today. Mrs. Slusser, also named Mary, for which reason we will reference her as either Mrs. Slusser or Mary's mother for clarity, was a member of a Presbyterian church and was deeply interested in the adventures going forward in that foreign field, Calabar specifically. I had, said Mary, my missionary enthusiasm for Calabar in particular from her. She knew from its inception all that was to be known of its history. Both Mary and her elder brother Robert heard much talk of it in the home, and Robert used to announce that he was going to be a missionary when he was a man. Such a career was, of course, out of the reach of girls, but he consoled Mary by promising to take her with him. Sadly, Robert did not survive these years, and Mary became the eldest surviving child. Mary's father was a restless fellow with a penchant for alcohol. When Robert Slusser suggested moving to the up-and-coming city of Dundee to find a new job, Mrs. Slusser agreed, hoping that a change of location and acquaintances would help her husband to start afresh and succeed. Looking back on her childhood, Mary recollected that she was a wild lassie. She would often think back to these days, and incidents would come to mind that half amused and half shamed her. Some of her escapades she would describe with whimsical zest, and trivial as they were, they served to show that even then her native wit and resource were always ready to hand. An old widow used to watch the children running about, and in her anxiety for their welfare, sought to gather some of the girls together and talk to them, young as they were, about the matters that concerned their souls. One afternoon in winter, they had come out of the cold and darkness into the glow of her fire, and were sitting listening to her descriptions of the dangers that would befall all who neglected salvation. The words were like arrows to Mary's heart. She could not get the vision of eternal torment out of her mind. It banished sleep, and she came to the conclusion that it would be best for her to make her peace with God. She repented and believed. It was hell fire that drove her into the kingdom, she would sometimes say, 
But once there, she found it to be a kingdom of love and tenderness and mercy. And never throughout her career did she seek to bring anyone into it as she had come, by the process of shock and fear. I don't have an exact age for when Mary Slessor made her profession of faith, but from some details and timelines, it seems to have been before she started working, which was at the age of 11. So, as a child, Mary Slessor realized her need of salvation, which would begin her lifelong path of Christian service. Now, Mary's life was not easy. We will talk next about her work in the mill, before, but before that, we need to again reference her father, Robert. The change of scenery moving to Dundee did not change Robert Slusser, nor his indulgence in drink. He is said to have been a tender man when sober, but cruel and unfeeling when intoxicated. As the eldest, Mary knew all too well what was taking place with her father and the family's financial situation. Between dealing with his outburst and fearing exposure should their neighbors and church friends find out about Robert's drinking binges, mother and daughter spent a great deal of time in prayer as an example of his behavior, we will read an excerpt from Livingston's book of, about Mary Slusser. It says, On Saturday, after the other children were in bed, the mother and daughter sat sewing or knitting in silence through long hours, waiting in sickening apprehension for the sound of uncertain footsteps on the stairs. Now and again they prayed to quiet their, quiet their hearts, yet they longed for his coming. When he appeared, he would throw into the fire the supper they had stinted themselves to provide for him. Sometimes Mary was forced out into the streets where she wandered in the dark, alone, sobbing out her misery. These trying days of her childhood left their mark upon Mary for her entire life. These days of childhood were the memory that had the ability to send a spark of bitterness across the sweetness of her nature. And because of what she experienced, this added to her shyness and often reluctance to appear in public and speak. But while these events were awful, traumatic, and something a child should never have to fear, a hunger, a drunken father, lack of money, it did deepen her sympathy and pity for others. It made her the fierce champion of little children and the refuge of the weak and oppressed. It prepared her also for the task of combating the trade in, in alcohol on the west coast of Africa, and for dealing with the drunken tribes amongst whom she came to dwell. Her experience then was, indeed, the beginning of her training for the work she had to accomplish in the future. Her father passed away, and Mary became the chief support of her mother and siblings until their deaths. Those who knew her then state that her life was one long act of self-denial. All her own inclinations and interests were surrendered for the sake of the family, and she was content with bare necessities, so long as they were provided for. W.P. Livingston has done such a tremendous job laying out Mary's transition from girlhood to factory worker at age 11 that I'm going to just read the description here uh, as it's taken from his book, um, as anything I could write would, would not do her justice in the same way. So uh, allow me to read this um, example of Mary's life at age 11 when she began working in a factory. It says, The time came when Mrs. Slusser herself was compelled to enter one of the factories in order to maintain the house, and many of the cares and worries of a household fell upon Mary. But at 11, she too was sent out to begin to earn a livelihood. In the textile works of Masters Baxter Brothers and Company, she became what was known as a half-timer, one who wrought half the day and went to school uh, in connection with the works the other half. When she was put on full-time, she attended the school held at night. Shortly afterwards, she entered a uh, Rashewell factory to learn weaving under the supervision of her mother. After trying the condition in two other works, she returned around the age of 14 to Baxter's, where she soon became an expert and well-paid worker. Her designation was a weaver, or a factory girl, not a mill girl, this term locally being restricted to spinners in the mills. When she handed her first earnings to her mother, the latter wept over them and put them away as too sacred to use. But her wage was indispensable for the support of the home, and eventually beca she became its chief mainstay. Life in the great factory in which she was but a unit amongst thousands was hard and monotonous. The hours of the workers were from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., with one hour for breakfast and one 
for dinner. Mary was stationed in a room or shed, which has very much the same appearance today. Now is then, the belts are whirring, the looms are moving, the girls are handling the shuttles, and the room is filled with a din so continuous and intense that speech is well nigh impossible. Mary had to be up every morning at five o'clock, as she helped in the work of the home before going out, while similar duties claimed her at night. Though naturally bright and refined in disposition, she was at this time almost wholly uneducated. From the factory school, she had brought only a meager knowledge of reading and arithmetic, and she had read little save the books obtained from the library of the Sunday school. But her mind was opening. She became conscious of the outer world and all its interests and wonders, and she was eager to know and understand. In order to study, she began to steal time from sleep. She carried a book with her to the mill, and like David Livingston at Blantry, laid it on the loom and glanced at it in her free moments. So anxious was she to learn that she read on her way to and from the factory. It was not a royal road, that thoroughfare of grim streets, but it led her into many a shining region. Now I found another description about one of the jute mills in Dundee that I'm going to read about to help you have a little bit, you know, hopefully a better idea of what at age 11, 12, 13, 14, um, what kind of conditions she was working in. So allow me to read this. This is taken from uh, a website called whiteonfamily.ca. So let me read this uh, explanation, and the uh, link to this will be in the episode notes. So it says, work on the Dundee jute mills of the 19th century offered a little bit of drudgery, exhaustion, low wages, and constant danger. Most of the workers were women and little children. They cost less to employ, and employment law was virtually non-existent. And there was always the risk of accidents with machines, graphic descriptions of which were common reading in the local newspaper. In this day and age, it's hard to imagine the working conditions. Everybody would be covered in dust, clogging eyes, mouths, and noses. The noise of the machinery created an ever-present, ear-splitting din, with the result that many workers went deaf. Women outnumbered men three to one in the mills, an imbalance in the labor market that gained Dundee the nickname of Sheetown. It created a unique and tough breed of women, born out of being the main providers of the family. The mill girls were noted for their stubborn independence. Overdressed, loud, bold-eyed girls, according to one observer, and often roaring foul with drink, characteristics that cause consternation among the gentlefolk of Dundee. Working alongside the women would be thousands of children. Again, they commanded only low wages, and being so small meant they could pack the machines closer together. Children under nine would work as pickers, cleaning dust from beneath the machines. Health hazards were unavoidable. The heat, dust, grease, and oil fumes caused a condition known as mill fever, which would lead to, a, to respiratory diseases like bronchitis. Those are the conditions in which... Mary Slusser worked for over 17 years. Now we're going to pick up more about her early life, uh, but more of that, that, that transition period as we see her beginning to do uh, more Christian service, uh, some of the um, ways that God used her in Scotland, in her own area of Dundee, before she even stepped foot on the mission field of Africa, uh, in, in Cal that Calabar region. So this is where we leave the story of Mary Slusser as the girl is becoming a woman, but by no means is this the end of the story. Uh, there will be another episode out soon on the life of Mary Slusser. Um, it's going to be a few weeks. I really want to, to dig in a little bit more. Um, I feel like this, this episode kind of jumped around a little bit more than I wanted it to, but I hope you get the idea about Mary Slusser and, and her early life, the, the struggles she dealt with uh, between family, um, financial worry, and the life she led working in one of these mills. Um, but this shows the, 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 I don't want to say toughness, but that's the word that's coming to mind. The, the toughness, the determination, I suppose, of a Mary Slusser to work through situations that would not have been pleasant with family, with her working conditions. Uh, reading where this was talking about how uh, many of the, the girls who worked in the mill were loud, bold, um, drunk, and yet that was something that Mary Slusser did not do. She did not follow that path. Um, and we're going to learn more about the path she did follow next time. So thank you for listening to God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and ministries of God's people.